What good are grapes and pomegranates and milk and honey? If you do not taste and know that the Lord is good to your own soul and have the blessing of eternal life. And what good are fine fashions if you're not clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ and stand on the last day naked and ashamed before God and are cast into the lake of fire. And what good are wine and honey and milk if we must drink the cup of God's wrath forever in hell? No. Spiritual, rich, mouth-watering blessings are ours in Jesus Christ as they are pictured to us in Old Testament language in Deuteronomy chapter 8. And all of this prosperity, beloved, typified in Canaan, is given to Israel despite her unworthiness to receive it. It does not come by merit. They did not deserve it. And Moses would remind them of this. God giveth it to thee. For it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. He giveth it. And that word giveth means graciously gives out of the generosity of his own heart without merit. God testifies to his people through the prophet Moses that they do not deserve it, that God did not choose them because of anything he saw in them, any qualities that they had, but simply because he loved her. Was she the greatest of all people? No. She was a miserable, slaved nation in Egypt. If God was going to choose for himself the greatest of all people, he would have chosen the Egyptians, or maybe one of the seven nations of the Canaanites, who were greater than she was. Did she display any fine qualities that showed that she was deserving of the abundance of Canaan? No. The next chapter will show her whole history of being stiff-necked stiff and stubborn and rebellious against God. Time and time again she showed that she did not deserve any of the grapes and the honey and the milk and the pomegranates or anything else in the land of Canaan. She deserved to perish in Egypt and to perish in the wilderness. And every day Israel must have this before her consciousness. Every day that I spend in the land of Canaan, enjoying the prosperity of Canaan, which points me to the great salvation in the coming Messiah, every day I have forfeited by my sins, and yet God gives it to me in his great generosity to me. But God did not give this gift of grace to everyone in the land of Canaan. Remember the Canaanites. When the Canaanites lived in the land of Canaan, it also produced abundance of grapes and honey and pomegranates and all the rest. You remember when Joshua and Caleb went in as spies into the land of Canaan and they came back with a huge bunch of grapes that two men had to carry on a pole? There was abundance. Great abundance. But none of that was grace to the Canaanites. God gave all of that abundance to the Canaanites before Israel came to fatten them up for destruction. To ripen them in their sins. So that God would then destroy them by means of the sword of Joshua. And the carnal reprobate seed in Israel enjoy the prosperity of Canaan, the physical aspect of the prosperity of Canaan. But they had no grace from that. God was not showing his favour to them. They did not know the friendship of God and the forgiveness of their sins. And the same is true today. God gives prosperity to many wicked men. 
Many wicked men are millionaires or billionaires. They never seem to have any problems throughout their entire life. But God hits them and gives them prosperity as a token of his hatred and his wrath toward them. Not because he loves them, not because he has any favor towards them, but simply out of his wrath and justice toward them. No, there was no merit in this gift of Canaan. None whatsoever. But God was keeping his covenant. That he may establish his covenant. He said, I am the friend of Israel. I am the friend of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this is a token of my friendship. I give them this good land. I deliver them out of the bondage of Egypt. I bring them through the horrible waste howling wilderness. And I set them into this land which they may now enjoy. The riches of the honey and the pomegranates and the milk and all the rest. And in this way I am keeping my covenant. I declare myself to be their God. And I make them to be my people. That's why it says. The Lord thy God. Thou shalt remember. The Lord thy God. No other nation. On the face of the earth. Could say. That Jehovah. Was their God. God had not adopted to himself. The Canaanites. Or the Philistines or the Egyptians, or any great nation of the earth, but simply this small, insignificant people, the Israelites. And they could say, the Lord, He is our God, and He has promised to be to us everything that a God is to His people, and we are therefore to be faithful to Him as His people, to be devoted to Him, and to love Him, and to keep His commandments, and to walk in all of His ways. God loved Israel. He pitied her in her afflictions in Egypt. He preserved her throughout the wilderness. And now he puts her into the land of Canaan. This is God's covenant. It's his. My covenant. God conceived of this covenant in eternity. When he purposed in himself to choose for himself a people in Jesus Christ, who is the head of the covenant. And in time, he calls all of the members of that covenant. He justifies them, he sanctifies them, and he saves them. He brings them into the church, into his fellowship, so they enjoy that fellowship and all the blessings which Christ <coughs> purchased for them on the cross. And God is faithful to this covenant. He establishes his covenant, the text says. He makes it to stand firm. The devil tried to topple his covenant. God, remember, created Adam and Eve in the covenant as his friends. And the first thing the devil tried to do was to estrange God's friends from him. But God came and said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Showing he was making Adam and Eve his friends again. And throughout the Old Testament, the devil tried to destroy the covenant. And God's people showed themselves to be unworthy of the covenant. But God was faithful to his covenant. And as a token of that faithfulness, he actually brings them into the land which he had promised. Even though they did not deserve it. Even though they had forfeited every step of the way. He keeps his covenant. Because... He will be faithful to the oath which he swore to the fathers. That he may establish his covenant which he swore unto thy fathers as it is this day. 